welcome everybody. Here we are at the top of the hour. I see we still have a lot of people joining. Uh, so we'll give them a minute as they get in. And while they do that, I'll let you know. Uh, my name is Jana Langhorn, and I'm the Senior Director of Marketing here at Synergistic, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. And I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today for our webinar that will review our recent annual report, Measuring Progress, Expanding the Horizon. Um, I think you'll find it very interesting to see the findings that we found this year, year over year, from last year's annual report. Um, and then I think we're about a minute in, and it seems like we got quite a few people. So, David, if you want to go to the next slide, go over the housekeeping. So just to let everybody know, here in a minute, you will hear from David Finn, who oversaw the creation of this report. And along with him, you'll have Mike Vida, who oversees the uh, team that works with our hospitals during and after the assessments. And together, they'll be able to share very different and unique opinions and uh, input on how we revealed what we did in the annual report. So like I said, before we get started, I do want to do a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, all attendees will be on mute uh, to be able to talk to us and ask questions. You can see over in your control panel, there's a question drop-down box, and you can just type anything in there, and I'll be watching it throughout the session. And then about 15 to 10 minutes at the hour, we'll stop and uh, start going through those questions that you all have asked. And just to let you know, um, we'll also send a copy of the presentation and a recording of the webinar after uh, later this afternoon or tomorrow. That said, I'll introduce you to our speakers. First up, you'll hear from um, David Finn. He has been here with us for a few years now at Synergistic, and he's been in healthcare IT for over 30 years. And in that time, he spent most of his time in the provider space in a variety of roles, ranging from a system auditor to a CIO, as well as security and privacy, privacy officer, or as I like, like I hear him call it often, a recovering CIO. He's also participated on several different boards, such as Chime, AHIS, HIMSS North America. He has sat on several editorial boards, and he was a member of the HHS Task Force 405D Working Group. And then you'll also hear from Mike Vida, who is our manager of security services here at Synergistic, and he is a well-experienced healthcare-centric cybersecurity professional with 30 years of his career steeped in technology implementation, governance, and regulatory compliance in the healthcare industry, as well as some other industries. He's implemented and managed hundreds of systems and security technologies and has performed hundreds of cybersecurity program and technology assessments using various frameworks. Um, and then prior to his life here at Synergistic, he was managing cybersecurity at VCU Health, and he's held several positions throughout his 18 years at Marrying Washington Healthcare. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, David, to get our discussion started this morning. Thank you, Jana, and thank you, everyone on the call or in the webinar this morning. We know you're very busy, and so our plan is to uh, make this as meaningful and useful as we can since you're giving up your your important time to us. We uh, These are some of the things we're going to talk about today, our annual report and the findings. Uh, Mike Vida is going to do a deeper dive with you on some of the security issues, particularly around NIST, CSF, and some of the new things coming with NIST, CSF. And then I'm going to take it back and wrap up with the rest of the story, some new additions to the annual report this year around third-party risk and privacy and then we're going to open it up open it up and and let you ask us questions so uh, this year's annual report as jana mentioned is called uh, measuring progress and it made perfect sense to us following last year's uh, annual report that we would move from uh, improving readiness which was last year's to measuring progress uh, after all, in last year's report, I proudly reported that with NIST CSF and its broad adoption across the industry, that this report reflects the first real analysis across the industry with a consistently applied standard for assessing cyber risk. And then we started looking at the data as well as our own experiences. And uh, with what we were seeing in the industry. And, and then the standard NIST CSF was updated last year, and suddenly measuring progress was less a statement of what we were trying to do and more a question of how you really do measure progress. Uh, progress is very rarely a straight line, particularly in the security business. 
even if you could control for all the variables, which you'll never be able to do. And additionally, we felt it was important to include information on some of our other key knowledge bases uh, around privacy program assessments and the HIPAA security rule and, and from our vendor security management uh, information and services, uh, focused on the risks associated with third party partners. And I'll wrap that up uh, at the end after we get through all the security. But uh, uh, briefly, you're looking at the methodology. It's based on uh, hundreds of assessments we conducted in 2018. Uh, it is uh, based on third party analysis. This is not self-reported. So we believe it's a better picture of the industry. Uh, and the sample that we look at represents the entire continuum from critical access hospitals to large academic medical centers to physician practices and business associates. And then as you'll see in a few minutes, we divide and dissect the findings by many different criteria. And one thing I do want to call out here is some of the additions to our 2019 report over the 2018 report. We actually, uh, last year we only looked at the NIST CSF core elements. This year we dropped down into the category level. Uh, we've added the security and privacy rule. Uh, we've added the privacy monitoring piece that I mentioned already, and certainly third party risk assessment. So based on our assessments for 2017 or 2018, and using a six point scale of zero to five, which is uh, zero is incomplete to five being an optimized process, which means the process is defined, it meets its outcomes, and is continuously improved to meet relevant current and projected business goals. We determined the national average and then broke the details down based on organization type and size. In this year's report, we've included conformance with the HIPAA security and privacy rule, and we report on conformance rather than compliance for several reasons. Compliance would be difficult to determine as so much of the HIPAA security rule is addressable, which means you can be compliant without having implemented 100% of the specifications so long as you have addressed in an acceptable manner all the pieces you choose not to implement or will implement over a longer period of time. So it's completely possible to perform well against the HIPAA security rule and still have significant gaps in actual implementation of security functions and controls. Compliance may be fleeting and most measurements represent a point in time picture. Uh, technology, the policies and procedures around them, people and organizations themselves are in near constant flux in healthcare today. And finally, the point of the HIPAA security rule risk assessment is not compliance, but continuous improvement around your risk management processes. In our HIPAA security rule assessments, we look at 45 implementation specifications evaluated in four groups, which include administrative, physical, technical, and organizational, which includes policy, procedure, and documentation. And here you see the overall scores uh, for the NIST CSF conformance in 2017 and 2018, up slightly. When we looked at the HIPAA security rule, uh, much higher scores, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but a slight decline year over year. And in case you're wondering uh, what conformance means uh, around NIST CSF, you can't really be in compliance with the framework. So consequently, we don't use the term compliance around the NIST CSF either. Uh, one of the reasons being that NIST says you can't be in compliance with the NIST CSF. According to NIST, although companies can comply with laws and regulations on their own cybersecurity requirements, and they can use the framework to determine and express those requirements, there's no such thing as complying with the framework itself. The framework, they say, should be used and leveraged. 
So we've adopted an audit kind of approach to NIST CSF. The core framework is a 20-page spreadsheet, if you're familiar with it, that lists five functions, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And it includes dozens of cybersecurity categories and subcategories, including such classics as anomalous activity is detected and provides informative references of common standards, guidelines, and practices. Now, we at Synergistic agree with most practitioners that the core is an invaluable resource when used correctly. For NIST, proper use requires that companies view the core as a collection of potential outcomes to achieve rather than a checklist of actions to perform. So expressed differently, the core outlines the objectives a company may wish to pursue while providing flexibility in terms of how and even whether they want to accomplish them. We simply work across those core functions, categories and subcategories, and verify that an entity is able to accomplish them. We verify that the controls, policies, and procedures are in place, documented and repeatable to be able to achieve those outcomes and score them across the 22 controls in the five core elements. And lastly, the other question you may have is what conformance means in terms of maturity scores. And we use the COBIT model, which I described above, which is a six-point scale ranging from zero to five. And we have defined conformance as a rating of three or higher. So we're looking for an established process defined and documented, and that's really a three that addresses the particular control expectations for the category and associated subcategories, which would ultimately get you a rating of at least a three. Now, what we see in the roll-up that we looked at in 2018 is something that we've seen in our assessments over many years, and that is conformance with the HIPAA security rule does not directly correlate with actual security risk or your risk posture. It is not uncommon to see organizations with HIPAA security scores in the percent range of upper 80s to mid 90s and have missed CSF conformance scores around the 50% point. While it's important to be compliant, you, you need to be compliant with applicable laws and regulations Compliance really doesn't offer much protection against attack or breach unless you're being attacked by an auditor. Compliance <laughs> is simply not security. <laughs> and while we have heard this rule for several years now that compliance is not security, uh, in this year's report, this data is a clear indicator that HIPAA security rule conformance hovers in the low 70 range year over year. NIST CSF hovers in the upper 40% range. And in 2018, this represented a, a roughly 29% gap in conformance rates between the HIPAA security rule and the NIST CSF. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, conformance with NIST was up 2% year over year. Well, conformance with the HIPAA security rule was actually down by 2%. And in 2018, you probably realize and, and remember that there was a lot of news and a lot of questions about the age and the relevance of HIPAA in 2018. It's an old rule that didn't address new technologies. And, and this shift in the scoring where NIST is going up and the security rule is going down may actually be reflective of some of those discussions or may indicate that the HIPAA security rule is truly less relevant in healthcare today than it was when the security rule became effective in 2005. Today's business models, care delivery models, technology, and the threat landscape would be nearly unrecognizable uh, in the world of 2005. So uh, it is a, a whole different world. And these are the key takeaways. I, I've already said it, compliance is not security. 
Uh, some of the interesting things I think you'll find as we drill through the report uh, in today's session is that privacy can be better in smaller organizations, and we see that uh, indicated, uh, but pro security can be harder to implement and carry out in small organizations. Uh, as we look at uh, some of the other issues we, look, we exposed this year, the privacy issue and third-party risk, uh, privacy monitoring is very focused on a few key things. It is not as robust as it should be, particularly with what is coming around new privacy rules. And third-party risk is really still in its very early stages. People are just beginning to get a handle on it. Uh, we noticed, uh, in fact, I just read this morning that 65% of the breaches across all industries were related to a third party. Uh, and so we're seeing this pick up the list of importance, but we're still in the early stages of actually managing it. And uh, Mike is going to talk about some of the changes to NIST CSF, which will uh, actually accelerate third party risk management. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to give you a deeper dive into this year's report and finding. Thank you, David. That was great. I love the whole attack by an auditor thing. That was hilarious. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go and take Dave's great opening and start to dive deep in some of the stats that we were talking about from the report. Um, uh, we talk about, of course, as David alluded to, we talk about conformance with the cybersecurity framework um, and what that means. Um, CSF covers a wider scope than HIPAA used to. So obviously CSF covers the broad range of what's going on in an organization from a cybersecurity perspective and not just what's narrowly focused on EPHI or patient data alone. So from the scoring perspective, you'll see this reflected in the scores that are coming up on the, on the slides that I'm going to show. Um, we look at a three, like David said, as a, uh, a compliance or I should say a conformance level where you're I would say audit proof, but you're prepared for an audit at that point. So that means that you're fully, you've done the math, you've done the work to get to a secure state, and you've also documented that, and you also include evidence in that documentation of what you're doing. So if you've got that entire range done from uh, getting the work completed to actually running your program and then documenting what you've done, you're, you're really in a good state. Uh, levels in four and five of the uh, COVID scale, of course, talk about getting that process even better and improving on it on a, on a routine basis, a cyclic kind of basis. Uh, so like I said, we consider an organization fairly well prepared when they're at a, a maturity level three. That does not mean that organizations aren't doing great at a level two. So maturity level two kind of says you're doing the work, you just not, you might not have it fully manageable or repeatable yet, and it's not at the point where uh, it's fully documented. But that means you're actually doing it. You're actually kind of meeting the intent of those controls. So that said, let's look at the stats. Uh, next slide, Dave. All right, great. So from this perspective, uh, looking at uh, organization size and type, uh, you might notice a little difference from last year in that we report on different types of organizations. Uh, for instance, this year we added assisting living facilities, accountable care organizations, and payers to the mix. We frequently change those up you know, for the presentation and for the report based on trends in the industry and, you know, like organization types that are on the move or environments that are changing and stuff like that. So the data sets we evaluate are still there and still the same. We just report on different highlights, you know, on each of our, uh, each of our annual reports. So considering the graph in front of you for organization type, uh, you'll notice that assisting living facilities show a high conforming score at 95%. Uh, that can probably be explained by the fact that they are typically less automated. So the relatively high conformance level may be an indicator that they are managing a less complex digital environment. Uh, notice also that accountable care organizations' conformance jumped a little bit, uh, and that's probably related to the fact that since they're a relatively new type of organization, most are being built from scratch or from parts of organization, larger organizations. Uh, you know, when you build something from a greenfield, you can bolt on security a lot easier than trying to retrofit it on something that already exists. So we think that heightened focus as a brand new type of organization is probably uh, showing there. Uh, and also physician groups increased significantly this year, which in my experience from assessing them directly uh, shows that they're starting to become aware of the risk. A lot of them weren't to, to begin with or in the, the few years leading up to this. 
uh, and they're taking steps to address uh, their program maturity and, and security in general. Uh, I've noticed that they're starting to overcome that independence inertia, is what I call it, where they are, you know, loosely or maybe even tightly, you know, bound together groups of physicians and everything that are working together to get, you know, uh, good economies of scale and what they're doing, but they still want to kind of do things their own way. And while that's that's great and very flexible, uh, a lot of the visibility and, and the centralization of the security component doesn't really come into play. So now they're starting to see where that really is a necessity, and they're starting to focus more on security. So I'm glad to see that bump. Okay, next slide. Okay, so from hospital type, from the acute care facility type, um, obviously health systems continue to perform well, um, and they're going up. Uh, that's likely due to the larger resource pools they have available. Obviously, we know more people and more money make a difference in maintaining effective security programs. I don't think anybody would uh, disagree with that. Um, uh, notice that academic medical centers in this, in our uh, set of data, tend to suffer from a statistical anomaly. Uh, there are relatively few assessed, since there are relatively you know, fewer of them, uh, and when any one of them goes down, that causes the, the results to skew a little bit, uh, and it might not be indicated, you know, an indicator of, you know, anything going wrong there. It's just, or any kind of severe trend. It's just that it's a smaller set of stuff, you know, you're measuring, um, you know, the wild swings are possible. So like I said, we don't see a drop in this trend uh, as a drop in conformance overall, but I did want to say that AMCs do face uh, greater challenges to maintaining consistent and effective security programs because of the nature of their business. We do have uh, legitimate drops that occur there, and that does happen you know, from year to year. So obviously, you know, when you're dealing with alternate sources of, of income, like grants coming in, and that might not go through the gates for you know, funding, so that doesn't really get uh, put into the, the mix of security you know, um, checking that normally things would go through, it's kind of hard for the security programs to keep up. And of course, my, my own experience there you know, uh, comes to bear. Uh, notice that critical access hospitals, they have historically had a greatest, the greatest struggle achieving conformance due to, you know, resource issues. Uh, they jumped, they jumped this year from 18 to 42 percent, uh, which shows great improvement, uh, and kind of signifies that they're starting to find, um, new and clever ways to divert resources to security. So that overall is very, uh, encouraging. All right, Dave, next slide, please. All right. From the perspective of number of employees, obviously we know this size matters. Uh, larger organizations here tend to show better conformance specifically, and smaller ones tend to find conformance uh, harder to achieve. Um, this probably is a function of the user to security staff ratio, which I, I love to talk about whenever we go into workshops. Um, as the total overall staff gets smaller, the number of dedicated security staff tends to decrease, obviously, because of, of the mix. Um, but interestingly, there's a break point there. In smaller organizations, as you go smaller and the security staff gets smaller, it becomes much more difficult to maintain a, a you know, a, a well-functioning security program because, you know, a small team of maybe one or two folks, it's difficult for them to set strategy, operationalize security efforts, uh, and that doesn't matter if the organization is 50, 100, or 500 in size. You know, the smaller team you have, the harder it is to do. So at that band of user level or employee level, we see a, a drop. Now, it's interesting, though, that the less than or equal to 500 users band did jump from last year. Uh, so it seems like, again, small organizations are finding creative ways to address security despite the smaller security staff. So it's interesting. I used to, I went to a, a, one of our clients and did an assessment where we were asking them hard questions about their security program, and they were, you know, not coming up with really great answers. And finally, he says, he holds up the, I'm going to hold up the shield of small company to your questions and just deflect them. I thought that was absolutely hilarious. Anyway, next slide, please. Okay, so from the bed size perspective, again, the previous uh, trend, same thing here. As bed size goes up in the organization, so does conformance. However, it's interesting to note here that organizations in the 1 to 500 bed band decreased in conformance from 2017 to 2018. So we think that this is a statistical trend that we attribute to a larger number of medium-sized hospitals recently coming into our statistical pool and coming in with less conformance overall. It's an encouraging trend because it seems like we're getting more people in to actually, you know, do that work and actually start, you know, assessing what they're, what they're doing and getting their programs better. So we, we like to see that, although it kind of took that band down a little bit uh, from last year. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so by revenue, 
interesting about this, and I would almost want it to say, instead of by revenue, maybe by spend in IT or spend you know, in overall security. But the overall trend here is that conformance does follow revenue, but it's not really a direct link. I mean, there's a lot of play and a lot of you know, movement across these figures. So while revenue doesn't necessarily translate to cybersecurity spend or conformance in general, uh, there is a little bit of a, a reflection there. So the lesson here is that, that revenue, while we would think it might be more of an indicator, really isn't that big of an indicator. Uh, what is, is, and what this does show, is that organizations are starting to spend wisely for cybersecurity needs, uh, letting the objectives of their program, based on their evaluation of risk, drive their spend as opposed to, you know, just what they're bringing in the door and, you know, just wrote, throwing it out there. But, you know, obviously there still is a trend. You can see it starts small at the top and goes down towards the bottom and it gets bigger. So there is that statistical trend that, hey, we got more money, we can spend more money on security, obviously. All right, next slide. All right, so now we're gonna dive deeper into, uh, like David was telling you, we're not gonna just go to the, the major function areas, we're also gonna dive deep and start looking at uh, what that means overall. Uh, so obviously identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover are our major functions. Uh, most of these are the same year to year, um, except for detect and protect usually, you know, are smaller or lower and usually don't get as much uh, bumps. But we did see a little bit of a drop in protect this year that's a little bit different. That's why I put that little yellow arrow there, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but note in all functions, the average is less than three. So the industry as a whole still needs more work. I mean, we're not to that level where we're audit, you know, prepared yet. We are still, we're doing the work in most cases. Some cases we're not doing quite as much work. We're only at a level two, maybe a tick above it. So we, we still need some more work there. Uh, next slide. Okay, so these tables have a lot, had lots of numbers on them. These tables indicate the organization type and hospital type, the average conformance broken down by CSF functions. So this is now inside the functions, what are they doing based on the type of organization? So note that payers, assisted living facilities, and ACOs here broach the three level in average conformance in some of the functional areas. I think that's probably a reflection of the relatively smaller sample size for those type of organizations but it's also a function of their organizational characteristics. Like I said, simpler business models, focused targets, means they can get better in security because they're not doing such a wide range of things, not covering all the bases or, or, or a wide range of bases. Uh, but overall, the trend still shows that detect and protect seem to be lagging from this perspective. Critical access hospitals, physician groups, and acute care hospitals still showing lower maturity than the others in that respect. All right, next slide. Okay, so from the perspective of size again, employees and bed size, this actually reflects the ec and echoes the trend we saw in the previous slides. So the larger the staff, the greater number of beds seem to have correlations to higher averages by function. The trends are very close and almost linear. I mean, very few exceptions if you look at the numbers, they go straight up, like in respond on the number of employees, it's 20, 24, 26, 30, and then one little drop to 28, and then 31. So most of these are, you know, a linear progression upward based on the size uh, either the employee set or the, the bed size. Next slide. Okay, by revenue again, it's a little bit different look at that same slide we saw earlier. Same thing here, it's a little bit inconsistent. There's not a direct link between revenue and conformance. Uh, and we are also seeing that detect and protect and responds might indicate here an inability of organizations with lower revenue to afford the more expensive staff and technologies that increase the capabilities in those areas. Like you'll see in protect, detect, and respond down at the less than 50 million uh, revenue mark, you know, we're still under two. We're at one through one seven, one three, and one seven across the board. So obviously not having an, that much money, we certainly can't put technology in place. We can't get a lot of staff to throw at the problem. So what do we do? We have to be a little bit more creative there. All right, next slide. And here's where we start talking about the actual subcategories within each function. So these subcategories will probably make more sense to you now that you see them. So it's like asset management, business environment, risk assessment, and risk management strategy. Now we're talking about, you know, seeing instead of the overall macro picture, we're seeing a little bit down in the, into the weeds. So um, for the identified function, we noticed that it's weak and soft in the asset management and business environment areas. And I think this reflects the relatively immature state of asset management and healthcare in general. I actually did my master's thesis on that. Um, 
It includes physical assets, of course, which are the obvious things, you know, knowing where your stuff is, but also knowledge and tracking of vulnerabilities the organization faces, as well as uh, sensitive data tracking and classification. Uh, remember that EPHI, or sensitive data of any kind, is healthcare's goal. We need to know where it is, how it's used, and where it goes in order to protect it well. And this is a reflection that that's not being done, as well as other things. Risk management, of course, risk, risk management, risk assessment strategy, doing pretty well. Next slide, please. Okay, from the protect function, or inside the protect function, we've got access control, awareness and training, data security, information protection processes and procedures, maintenance, and then protective technology. This is everything that goes to protect all the stuff that we have in our environment. Uh, so we see that uh, protection is still very low, not even approaching the two maturity mark here, uh, and also information protection, data protection, or data security as well. Uh, the surprising change here that we saw is the awareness and training drop. So it seems unusual that all the phishing and phishing training going on, because we're, everybody's well aware of that, we still see a dip here. Uh, so we think that overall the softness in that area is a reflection of the deeper understanding of the requirements in this area based on the CSF over HIPAA and that awareness uh, and that organizations uh, feel that they haven't covered all those bases yet. So no longer are we talking about just the training requirements for passwords, login monitoring, and malware protection that everybody's familiar with from the HIPAA days. But we're also thinking about, um, you know, the entire gamut of security training that needs to be uh, that needs to be trained. So what needs to happen is awareness and training needs to cover everything from a cybersecurity perspective that it can, based on the program, and be tied to the user's role or level of risk. So next slide, please. Okay, in detect again, we see another weak area overall. Uh, not as weak as some of the other ones, but. Anomalies and events, pretty good. Security continuous monitoring, a little bit faltering there, and then detection processes. So likely due to expertise needed to do this area well, um, the large technology footprint that needs to be in place and managed, and the need for adequate staffing to do that. And of course, those are all you know high dollar items. It's a lot of expense, uh, and it's uh, difficult to do without those kind of things. So that's probably why we see a little bit softer area here. Uh, the areas that need uh, commitment from the organization's highest levels to implement um, are sometimes potentially burdensome. So they, you know, leadership needs to get in and kind of push those things that really bolster this category. Things like disk encryption, multi-factor authentication, blocking or encrypting USB drives, blocking webmail, which we know everybody wants to use webmail or their own personal cloud storage. They tend to want to do that and taking that away from them, you know, is, is a tough sell in most organizations. And organizations have to have the commitment to do it in order to shore up uh, the protection against the you know, data loss. So that's kind of what we see here is a reflection of that. Next slide, please. Okay, respond category. We see here that the response category, and we're talking about incident response overall and how we respond to uh, any kind of incidents in our organization. It's uniformly well represented across the board. Uh, what we typically see here is less documentation. We see plans in place, but they're not complete, not full, and that's why we don't see full threes across the board here. But from the response planning, communication, analysis, mitigation, and improvements elements, response planning is the piece of, hey, let's put in place an IR plan, and then it should have communications, analysis, mitigation procedures, and then improvements built into it. So it's an overarching plan. Now, the reason we see this stronger than most categories is because Everybody has dealt with some form of cybersecurity incident. Uh, most have had a breach or ransomware event of some, you know, variety or severity. Uh, and even if you're talking about things like now we're hitting on computers or, uh, you know, hitting a server here or there, you know, all organizations have had something of that nature that's gone on. So they've actually built the processes to do this. They just haven't, like, formalized all of them yet. So that's where we see not quite the three that we want, but still doing pretty well from a perspective of being able to handle this overall. Uh, largest areas of improvement to be gleaned in this area would be, you know, obviously formalization of those response plans, uh, clear breach escalation processes. We see that constantly from an assessment perspective where uh, they might have a great IR plan, but there's no good process or procedure or criteria to say, yes, we might have a breach. Let's roll in compliance if we need to. And of course, testing of the plans. We should be testing our folks to make sure that our plan does work, and of course, improving it uh, when we find deficiencies, and of course, training those people uh, when we need to. Uh, next slide, please. From the recover perspective, uh, you'll notice that we've got the planning element at the top, which means we're gonna have DR plans in place to recover. 
uh, just from a disaster and also from just point outages. And then, of course, we got the improvement section in the middle and communications at the end. So it's relatively mature overall. Uh, the soft middle section, we think, is kind of understandable. It includes formalization of the improvement process, turning the lessons learned, things that we usually do in recovery events, into actual improvements of the recovery plans themselves. That part seems to be uh, missing in some of the assessments we do and some of this in the data set. But we also should be, if we're not doing it, we should be testing the DR plans to make sure that we can roll those things in. Uh, the key areas of immaturity we see still in this section are a lack of an enterprise linkage to IT DR plans. There's not that much talk between what IT is doing and what the rest of the organization does. We tend to do recovery from the perspective of the clinical side very well and from, you know, downtime procedures and, you know, having those in place but we don't have a good linkage and there's no direct link from the top down saying, yes, IT, we need to have these up in this order. So we need to have that. And then the other piece would be the detailed IT recovery plans for systems and infrastructure elements that are, are not in place. We tend to have you know, lists of things that we bring up first, but they're not very detailed. So that would be an area we could improve here. Next slide, please. Okay, with all the details covered, uh, talk a little bit about the changes to the NIST CSF that came out, in, well, actually for 2019, but it came out in 2018. So version 1.1 of the CSF was ratified in 2018. It definitely includes a lot of improvements, including an entire new category. So let's see what those are. Next slide. All right, so from the perspective of the CSF 1.1 changes, uh, it's clarified a few things, um, which is good because there were some terminology problems in it. Uh, and it also had a, a, prob a, a part of it that was really neglected, and that was supply chain. That's actually been built in as an actual full category now. So instead of 22 categories, we go to 23. So in the supply chain area, we start talking about, um, you know, processes to review things before they get purchased. We're looking at protection of the supply lines, for, you know, prevent introduction of hardware-based kind of vulnerabilities. And we actually saw that in the news recently. Uh, other elements of the supply chain include, you know, requirement to build cybersecurity in every phase of supply chain, including, you know, the whole system development life cycle, which tracks everything from start to finish in an organization or from inception to, um, you know, rolling it out the back door when it's ready. So that stuff is now included in, uh, in supply chain management. Uh, access control has been expanded and updated. Uh, obviously, access control changes constantly. There are all kinds of new things going on there, and this is reflecting that in the new version of CSF. A uh, good thing is they've also talked about data security and protective technology bump ups as well, as well as analysis and under the respond category. Uh, and of course, what I talked about earlier was the language inconsistencies of some of the grammar. I do recall that in the CSF 1.0, they kind of used incident and event interchangeably in the respond stack, and that kind of threw everybody off. So they've actually cleaned that up. So that does it for me. Thanks for listening, and I'll turn it back over to Dave. Thank you, Mike, for, for those insights. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, even I learned a few new things today. Uh, and now I'm going to kind of wrap up here with the rest of the story, some of the new additions that we mentioned, uh, and, and this CSF 1.1 is a perfect introduction to uh, third-party risk. Uh, we collect a lot of data from our assessments and the services we provide, and, and based on the feedback we got from our uh, report last year on security, we decided to expand that look into third-party risk. And, and I don't need to tell anyone on this phone call that business associates and, and other third parties represent a growing risk to all businesses and they account for a growing number of reportable breaches, particularly in healthcare. The HIPAA security rule requires that covered entities be responsible for understanding the security posture of their business associates, of vendors, and other third parties who receive, process, store, or transmit data on behalf of the organization. And looking at data from our vendor security management program, we categorized vendors by risk level from high to very low, and we then mapped categories to the NIST CSF and identified the top five gaps for high and medium risk vendors. 
23% of the vendors uh, we identified fell into that high or medium risk category. The top five NIST CSF related gaps broke down in order of percent of vendors found to be lacking in that category as uh, number one was risk assessment with 17% of the vendors. Number two, data security with 12%. Governance was number three at 10%. Identity uh, management and access control at 9%. And uh, a two-way tie in fifth place uh, at 8% for both asset management and information protection processes and procedures. So I want to dig a little deeper into what these uh, categories really mean. So while all risks to an organization may be equally concerning uh, of the high and medium risk vendors, these were the top categories of the NIST CSF framework and most frequently identified as lacking. And in terms of risk assessment, uh, gaps uh, were uh, identified in terms of assessing risk. Uh, and, and that constituted uh, the risk assessment, like I said, constituted 17% of findings across the vendors that we judge to be medium or high risk in 2018. And this area of NIST highlights uh, the gaps in the vendor's understanding and efforts of cybersecurity risk to organizational operations, organizational assets, and individuals. Uh, more specifically, our assessments discovered that our clients' vendors lack activities that identify threats as well as the potential business impacts of identified vulnerabilities. Additionally, these high-risk vendors often lack established or formally documented methodologies to prioritize and address identified risk. So something you certainly want to ask about with vendors. In terms of asset management, uh, gaps in managing information assets were, were number two at 12% of the findings across those higher medium uh, risk vendors. And this indicates that these high risk vendors are not properly identifying and managing the assets that enable business processes and activities in regard to business objectives and risk strategy. And this includes things like maintaining accurate inventories of devices and systems, software and applications, and external information systems. Without accurate information system inventories, vendors do not have an organized approach to identifying where risk to their organization lies thus posing a risk and exposing vulnerabilities to their clients, organizations, and operations as well. Uh, governance was uh, in third place with the 10% of findings, and uh, this area of NIST CSF focuses on the processes an organization employs to effectively provide oversight to regulatory, legal, risk, environmental, and operational requirements, and ensure that they're not only met, but maintained. And our findings uh, across the vendor community we were looking at related to uh, the governance highlights uh, show gaps in information security policies and understanding the legal and regulatory requirements. I'm sure not a shock to anyone who's negotiated a business associate agreement and their own risk management policies. Uh, findings related to governance also indicated that an organization lacked an experienced security professional on staff. So they may not have a chief information security officer or even a person uh, designated as the security uh, person, the, the, the one person charged with security at their organization. As a general rule, organizations without a dedicated security role often had a higher number of other gaps, including lack of policies, lack of risk assessment, and inadequate controls, which made them more susceptible to falling victim to known vulnerabilities, disruption, or exploitation. 
Uh, now we move into the privacy portion of, of our report. And in this year's report, we've expanded uh, some of our metrics to privacy, and we believe this is going to be an area of increasing attention and focus. It will likely, frankly, go beyond HIPAA with a number of international uh, laws like GDPR, and even if you're not uh, directly impacted by GDPR, it's affecting the way people and, and even our society thinks about privacy. Uh, and then we have state laws and regulations. Uh, there are multiple states that are looking at expanded privacy rules, and those will have blowback or impacts to healthcare providers, even in states where we've uh, seen that HIPAA-covered entities were, were released from the requirements of the privacy law. We're finding many covered entities have private for-profit arms or are engaged in other uh, revenue generating processes that then do impact them under the new uh, privacy uh, rules in those states. So we're gonna, we're gonna shift our discussion now from security to privacy uh, and conformance with the HIPAA privacy rule based on our assessments, as you'll see, starts well above both the NIST CSF and the HIPAA security rule levels of conformance, 77% in 2018, which is down from 83% in 2017. Now, the privacy rule has been around uh, two years longer than the security rule, but healthcare has long recognized the issues and concerns around patient privacy. When healthcare was predominantly documented in conversations and on paper, the issue was frankly less a security issue than one of privacy and confidentiality and ethics, physician or caregiver ethics. And these issues were addressed consequently as ethical issues, not security issues. But while the scores were generally higher, Privacy is rarely a black and white issue, so there is still room for improvement here. There appears to be a significant drop in HIPAA privacy rule conformance from 2017, which I mentioned. And, and one of the reasons is we conducted significantly more privacy-related assessments in 2018. So we may have a more accurate reflection of the status of the sector because we did so many more, more data, uh, hopefully a uh, better picture. We anticipate going forward uh, much more focus on HIPAA privacy conformance over the next several years, uh, particularly as specific state requirements begin to take effect. I mentioned there's a, around 13 states that have privacy legislation pending. Uh, the most notable one is the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, which has been passed. The effective date is January of 2020, so lots of activity, and that is very far-reaching because it will cover and protect California residents outside of the state of California. While our findings are grouped and organized slightly differently than those for security, we did go back and look at both our 2017 and 2018 data. And what we see when we look into the data is that physician groups and payers have improved, while hospitals and health systems have declined in terms of privacy rule conformance. Physician groups increased HIPAA privacy conformance from 74 percent to 82 percent, while hospitals and health systems declined from 94 percent to 72 percent conformance. And we also note that payers improved from an 84 percent conformance with HIPAA privacy in 2017 to 97 percent in 2018. We believe that the size of the decline in hospitals and health systems can be attributed to greater numbers being assessed in 2018 and a more normal data distribution, just like uh, Mike talked about the number of academic medical centers in terms of security. Now, year over year, organizations with an annual revenue under $1 billion stayed fairly even with a 74% uh, score in 2017 
and a 73% score in 2018. Organizations, though, with annual revenue in excess of $1 billion saw a significant improvement, moving from 76% in 2017 to 85% in 2018. And while we had fewer tiers broken down than for our HIPAA security conformance, this does align with the same pattern of improvement among the largest organizations with greater revenue, while smaller organizations were more of a mixed bag on improvement and performance. We found that in 2018, smaller organizations by number of employees scored 81% conformance on the privacy rule, which is up from 78% in 2017. The next tier, 5,000 to 10,000 employees, scored 72% down from 100%, which is a pretty unlikely score, and that was probably skewed by again having less data from 2017 for this group. Organizations with more than 10,000 employees weighed in at 89% in 2017 and slid back to 62% in 2018. Unlike security, less may actually be more, and smaller organizations may do better with privacy than large counterparts due to less complexity, less technical complexity. It's more accessible for most members of the workforce. Uh, you don't have a lot of technology. You don't have to do updates. It's sitting down and talking with people. Uh, in terms of privacy monitoring, there's a lot of different scenarios involving unauthorized access to patient information. But as we looked across the uh, customers and the tools we use for monitoring that, uh, it still indicates the most common actions uh, monitored when using a technology solution uh, for user access to records is uh, household members looking at each other's information, neighbors, coworkers, and high profile, high profile patients or VIPs. And our monitoring on behalf of clients during 2018 found unauthorized access was dominated by access to these types of records as illustrated by the, the graphic you're looking at now. While not all such access is determined to be inappropriate or unauthorized, upon investigation, some of these incidents identified by covered entities are violations of the privacy rule and HIPAA breaches requiring notification to individuals and to the Office of Civil Rights. Healthcare organizations, though, can reduce the risk and related cost of privacy violations by proactively monitoring user activity in their systems containing EPHI, and a proactive uh, monitoring and auditing program can be designed to fit with the organization's risk analysis and risk mitigation strategy. And it should play an early, a key part in early identification of security and privacy violations to avoid major reportable incidents. Now, an emerging trend we're seeing in privacy monitoring is the adoption of behavioral analytics technology which enables greater precision in analyzing user activity to identify the actions that are most likely to be a violation or a threat to the organization. And this allows organizations to go beyond the simple identification of individual policy violations, like those that are identified in this graphic, and allows you to move to identifying patterns that represent potential theft, or misuse of EPHI that could lead to much more costly incidents. Uh, behavioral analytics permits the analyst to identify activities like lower than expected access to EPHI by a workforce member, which can point to underperformance, potentially a patient safety concern. Someone isn't getting the caregiver views or attention they should be getting, or it could be the unauthorized use of another caregiver's password 
translating into inappropriate access, which raises privacy concerns. And this year we actually saw a number of providers moving to a monitoring a platform that included or adopted behavioral analytics. So this will be a new trend going forward as more of these tools are deployed in the sector. So as, as we looked at the statistics across the industry and we borrowed from the Protanus breach barometer, uh, saying that insiders were responsible for 28% of healthcare breaches in 2018, and it took 255 days to detect a breach, you make a pretty compelling argument for the user behavioral analytics. What we found is over 60% of, uh, of uh, the assessments, we saw a lack of uh, policy around uh, privacy rules and that kind of thing, not surprising. Uh, and, and Mike mentioned some of the documentation issues uh, in security as well. We're also seeing an increasing interest in protecting the privacy of individuals' health and other information. So we are seeing more focus, like I said, not only in society uh, and, and Facebooks of the world and the Amazons, but even in healthcare, there is uh, more attention being paid to the privacy piece of this. And we wanted to get ahead of it and include it in this year's report so we can actually start tracking that uh, shift in attention. So uh, that is kind of uh, the details at a very high level. If you would like to get your own copy of uh, Measuring Progress, Expanding the Horizon, and, and all the juicy details, you can get it at uh, the Synergistic website and uh, feel free to download that uh, for your perusal. And uh, at that point, I'm gonna hand things back to Jana and thank you all for your time and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, both of you. So just a reminder, you can send questions over in the chat on the control panel. Um, throughout the session, I had a couple that I went on ahead and responded to. Um, one I got a couple of times. Just a reminder, we will send out a copy of the presentation and the video. Uh, but then more specific, I got a couple of questions um, that I'm going to pass to you all. So, David, I think this is a question for you. Um, so someone said they've seen the report, they know where they stand, but they want to know how can they use this as a tool to help make some specific cases um, with areas that they need to address within their organization. That, that's a great question. I've actually gotten feedback from a number of customers about that. In fact, earlier this spring, before the report was released, I had a number of CISOs call me and tell me they were preparing their board presentation. Uh, one of the things boards and, and even executive committees always want to see is, is how do we stand up? Are we doing the right things? Is this what the industry is doing? Are our are our competitors and our affiliates uh, doing the same thing? So this is really, uh, again, unlike many uh, surveys that are self-reported, this is more of an objective assessment across a broader sec section of the healthcare sector. So one of the things we see CSOs using is the tool uh, to indicate uh, issues. They certainly point out their like organizations and if they're lagging, it's an opportunity to say, see, we need to step it up here in the detect area. We're, we're, we're still lagging. Or, or maybe even the whole sector's lagging and we need to step it up so we're not the first target. Uh, the other thing I've seen some organizations do is they begin to, to move into merger and acquisitions. Perhaps they're buying physician groups or perhaps they're, they're starting to acquire or merge with other hospitals. It allows them to be prepared and to present information that helps uh, sell the case for building security and privacy into part of your due diligence. If we know physician practices lag in terms of security, let's build that into the assessment and let's build that in, if it's gonna cost money to secure them, let's build that into the valuation of the practices we're buying. So it, it's a great cross, uh, sector view of, of where we are, and that can be used whether you're ahead and want to stay ahead, or whether you're behind and need to catch up. 
All right, thank you so much. And then we're right at the hour. I am going to go ahead and ask one more, just in case there's any others that are trickling in. Um, this next one is, you know, they're wanting to know why um, we're assessing cybersecurity using the NIST CSF, and as and if that is better than HIPAA. Would you like me to take that one? This is Mike. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, like I said in the presentation earlier, it's you know the regulatory requirement is that we you know meet the requirements of HIPAA, uh, but HIPAA is a very narrowly focused regulation. It points to EPHI specifically in scope, so it doesn't get the breadth of the entire program. It doesn't. It's not designed to. Uh, assess anything outside of its very narrow scope, although it's a very important scope. Uh, the NIST CSF, of course, is a wide-ranging, you know, it's like the CISC certification, if everyone is familiar with that, where they say it's a mile wide and an inch deep. It covers everything across the broad spectrum of your security program, every element of it. So we think it's a better way to, uh, it's a better, you know, measuring stick to use to assess against, kind of like the ISO or something of that nature. All right, thanks. And then, so we're over the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the Q&As there. Uh, but when we do send out the follow-up email with the presentation and a link to the video, we'll also have a short survey. And in that survey, you have the opportunity to ask any unanswered questions that we didn't get to. And you'll also have the opportunity to provide your feedback on topics for the future that you would like to hear us address. And we'd greatly appreciate if you could take a few minutes to fill it out. And then uh, just the other things, we want to really thank you for joining us, and we're glad to have you here, and we really appreciate your time. And thank you to both of our presenters as well. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, everybody.